Hello and welcome back. It's kind of drizzly this morning, but that's okay. The rain will build atmosphere for what we're about to discuss. The plant I have to talk about today is called Calipogon tuberosus. And it is in Orchidaceae. Now, the uh, cool thing about orchids is that there are 28,000 different kinds, which means, obviously, if there's that many species, there's bound to be some occurring everywhere. This is the second largest family of plants there is, one of the largest families in general, and for comparison, they vastly outnumber um, all forms of mammals, amphibians, birds, and reptiles all put together. So, uh, this orchid here, the uh, scientific name, Calipogon here, genus name, translates into beautiful beard for a structure I will point out later, and tuberosis, the species name, indicates that it forms tubers. So, without further ado, uh, let us introduce you to this species. And here they are. So, there, I have been growing them for some time now. Uh, there are five plants flowering at the moment, uh, which is this one here, this one, this guy, this one, this one, and the other one. Yeah, see, so there's two here, one here, two here. Um, these plants are native to North America, uh, throughout much of the eastern United States, parts of the Caribbean, and parts of eastern Canada. And they grow in bog habitats, which, in my opinion, are the greatest kind of wetland there is, uh, being primarily rain-fed rather than spring-fed. So, because they get most of their water from the rain, they have nutrient-poor habitats that tend to favor far more unique plants than other environments. And these plants could be carnivorous, like, uh, for example, even in this pot right here. We have this guy, who will flower soon, and when it does, I'll get a video on him. But that is a sundew, a sticky carnivorous plant that somehow ended up in there. It's not supposed to be in there. And bog habitats are also primarily dominated by uh, sphagnum moss, which tends to make the environment extremely acidic and contributes partially to the severe lack of nutrients by its efficient acid mining. So they will secrete acid to free up nutrients, and then they will take nutrients and leave the environment inhospitable. So. While orchids are not known to be carnivorous, except with one very rare, very unusual species that might be located in South America, they do form fungal partnerships. So, each one of these flowers here will turn into a small seed pod if pollinated successfully. And this seed pod will contain millions of seeds that are only a small handful of cells each. So these seeds can scatter far on the wind, but because they're so small, they don't particularly have the opportunity to have very many nutrients. So what is an orchid to do? Well. The entire family of orchids 
will form a partnership with a fungus in the soil, if there is such suitable fungus available, and the fungus will feed the orchid seed long enough for it to begin producing leaves and return the favor. Some orchids, however, they prefer to remain parasitic, but this is not one of them. And even after the fungal partnership is established and the orchid is giving seeds back, or giving the sugars back, sorry, not seeds, the fungus will continue to extract nutrients, which will feed the orchid as it grows. Um, so the reason that these are called calipogon is because of this structure here, the little um, fluffy structure. Now that may look like pollen, but it is not. Uh, these orchids are a trick. There is no nectar and no pollen to be found up there. Instead, the pollen is found in this structure here. Uh, there are two pollen sacs called a plenium, and when this lures an insect in, it is hinged. So if I can just demonstrate this real quick. Hold the flower here, a insect will land on this and get slammed into the pollinium which will stick to the insect's back. And then the insect is left to fly off. And another cool thing about them is that these orchid flowers are the reverse of the typical ones. So over here I have a fairly generic moth orchid that comes from a grocery store. I've had this one for a while. But you can see the flowers are slightly reversed, or they're different. So we have one, two, three, and four components here. But this one has a one, two, three, and four. So this structure here is the same as this one, this, no sorry, this one is the same as this one, this goes here, these two are these two, and these two are at the back of the flower here. So, excuse me, once again, we have a one, two, the other part two of it, we have three, we have four, and we've got five independent structures here. And then on the moth orchids, we have the one, two, three, four, and five. So these flowers being reversed, I believe it makes them, technically speaking, right side up because most orchids undergo flower inversion as they grow, so this is how an orchid flower is right side up, not upside down like the vast majority of orchid species will have. Now, we've talked enough about the flowers, as spectacular as they are, uh, let us talk a little bit about the rest of the plant. Uh, well, actually, never mind. We haven't talked enough about the flowers. Um, the flowers on this species are relatively short-lived. On the moth orchid I showed you, they can be in bloom for give or take four months at a time. On this one, each flower is only open for four, maybe five days, but they open sequentially, so you can see some of these inflorescences here have the um, flowers that haven't opened yet, uh, this one up in the corner, and this one here, as well as that one, probably could be coerced to open today. Uh, I have five of these plants blooming now, as I mentioned earlier, but this is by far more than I have had before. In the past, I was having one, maybe two flower a year, and I think the reason for this is simply they had better conditions as well as the opportunity to grow. So, with the flowers out of the way, 
that leaves leaves. So, th this here is the grass orchid leaf, and you can perhaps see why they are called grass orchids. Their leaves are rather difficult to distinguish from proper grass. And I believe there are 11 or 12 of them in this pot, but finding them all is impossible. So we have one here that isn't flowering this year. These ones are, as is this one and this one. Uh, right back here we see one that isn't. And down at the very front of the pot, there are two more. So, with this species, the cultivation is actually rather simple. You take a decent chunk of peat, like sphagnum peat, a decent chunk of perlite, mix them together at about 50-50 ratio, uh, add live sphagnum moss on top just to keep it tidy if you want, but you don't have to, and then you leave them out in the sun in a tray of water. These plants absolutely demand full sun. They have leaves to absorb it, single leaf each. And then they will grow above whatever they're growing next to for the most part, so they're not shaded by other plants. Very few, very, very few tall plants can grow in bogs. Just because there isn't structural support they need, no nutrients, um, too much water, stuff like that. So these plants are not to be allowed to dry out at all. Uh, they will grow throughout most of the summer, and then in the fall, the leaf turns brown and the plant goes dormant. They should not dry out for dormancy. Leave them in the ground in a cooler area if you can, so don't take them out of their pots. Um, and then they will re-emerge depending on temperatures at some point between February and May. In the south, southern part of their native range, like Mississippi and the Caribbean, they emerge quite early. In New England and Canada, it appears that they emerge quite late, uh, toward the end of May, early June. Uh, they are not to be given fertilizers whatsoever. Uh, it will burn their roots, they don't need it. Uh, this is also true for most other bog plants, such as the carnivorous one I showed you briefly. And I would also advise that you keep the carnivorous plants away. Uh, this sundew in here should not be in that pot. It got in with seeds, and I slightly fear that it might end up crowding them out sooner or later, so at the end of this growing season, I will probably have to remove it. You should not interfere with any uh, wetland or carnivorous or other wetland plants that go dormant during their growing season. It sets them back significantly, if not outright kills them. And this extends to the orchids as well. Um, in the winter, they turn into a very convenient tuber, or actually, I think, anatomically speaking, it is a corm, which is fat and stem tissue and slightly resembles an egg, although a little bit smaller. And this corm will sustain them throughout the winter. You can, when they are in this stage, you can pick them up and handle them and transplant them if you feel the need to do so. If they are actively growing roots longer than about an inch, I would strongly recommend that they not be handled. Um, and lastly, this species will reproduce asexually. So when I first got it, I had only one. Then that year it produced one offset. Then there were four then eight, and now we're hovering around a dozen or so, although perhaps there are more than that beneath the soil surface. Uh, some of them did die over the winter, that's all right, there are many. And overall I would say that if you live in their native habitat uh, and have access to a sunny area, this species of orchid is probably the single easiest one to grow even easier than the moth orchids that 
I showed you briefly and you can find in grocery stores. However, there is just one last thing, um, or two actually. One, I mentioned the rain earlier. Uh, they should be watered with distilled water or rain. Tap water is often too rich in dissolved solids, in, as well as chlorine and stuff like that. And uh, these flowers here, while they happen to be pink this time, giving rise to the common name tuberous grass pink orchid, they also come in white. Uh, I would very much like to grow the white flowered variety as well, just for some change. And uh, that is pretty much it. These are one of my favorite plants to the extent that they are my profile picture. I think the one in the individual orchid in view right now is in fact the same individual that produced the flower I use as a profile picture. Um, I hope you are able to enjoy them as much as I do. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful day.